interested in in our class, and that is the electromagnetic force. We are going to specialize on the part of the electromagnetic spectrum where the energy of the photons is in the kilo electron volt and the million electron volt range, leaving the other parts of the electromagnetic spectrum for other classes. So let us uh, 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 try to uh, share the screen. And uh, I am going to uh, move to our NPRE 402 uh, link. Uh, so that is the uh, link for the summer course here. And uh, we are going to move to uh, the chapter on the electromagnetic uh, phenomena, which is really uh, in our area of interest, the, the part on the, uh, uh, just the gamma and X-rays. So uh, let us find the chapter on gamma and X-rays in our roster here on our, uh, so we are going to start today on the gamma rays interaction with matter. As uh, we know, gamma rays is part of the electromagnetic, fo uh, uh, electromagnetic spectrum. And uh, it is very important because usually uh, nuclear reactions are associated with the emission uh, of gamma rays. And uh, gamma rays can be, uh, 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 ionizing uh, radiation, meaning that uh, it's, it splits the atom into an electron and an ion. And in that case, it's destroying the molecular or the atomic nature of the atom. So it can have a, a deleterious effect on the biology. It's like, for instance, it can affect the strands of DNA uh, in our uh, cells uh, in general. Uh, there are several modes of interaction of gamma rays that we are going to cover. Uh, the, in the textbooks, they mentioned three out of six that we are going to cover uh, today. Uh, and uh, in that case, uh, on a cosmic scale, gamma ray bursts or magnetars also generate intense gamma radiation field that could affect space travel and exploration. So that's of interest to our aerospace engineers in general. When we talk about the uh, uh, gamma uh, rays or gamma photons, uh, or any part of the electromagnetic spectrum, we describe the energy uh, because they're not particles. We cannot write E is equal to half mv squared. We have to write uh, the uh, energy in terms of the frequency of the radiation. Let's call it nu here, the Greek N, uh, or the, uh, the inverse of the wavelengths of the radiation. And of course, the frequency of radiation is equal to the speed of light divided into uh, the wavelengths. So any radiation that has a very short wavelength, the lambda here in the denominator will be very small. And if it's very small, the energy that it carries becomes very large. Or you can say that a high frequency radiation like gamma rays uh, would carry a large amount of energy. C is the speed of light and H is the famous uh, Planck's constant, which has units uh, in the CGS or conventional system of units as ergs into second. Notice that uh, energy uh, uh, for uh, uh, particles that have a mass uh, is described by Einstein's law that E is equal to the mass uh, multiplied by the square of the speed uh, of light uh, uh, in that case. Uh, if we equate uh, the uh, energy carried by a photon uh, into uh, the energy as a mass, we get uh, a relationship that relates the mass to the frequency of the radiation or the wavelengths of the radiation. And uh, that could offer an explanation, uh, a partial explanation at least, uh, to explain the massive black mass and dark energy in the universe. Uh, we covered that in the chapter on the uh, strong uh, force uh, in general. 
so in that case, uh, this equation simply suggests that if radiation reaches a very high frequency or H nu, a very high energy, uh, it exhibits mass properties. And that is real. That's exhibited uh, in the laboratory. Uh, in fact, before we go further there, when we equate that mass relationship uh, to the uh, frequency relationship, we end up with a new constant of nature, which would be H over C square. And it would have very small uh, value in the units. We cannot measure it, but we can calculate it uh, in, uh, in this kind of uh, uh, derivation. All right, so we are going to uh, uh, bypass the relativistic treatment of masses because we have seen that before in other courses. And we look at how electromagnetic radiation uh, in our area of interest, the kilo electron volt and the million electron volt interact with matter. Uh, the most important uh, uh, interaction is uh, that uh, we see in uh, daily life is a photoelectric effect. And uh, in the photoelectric effect, when a photon of uh, electromagnetic radiation uh, hits a, an atom, uh, there is an atomic interaction. It does not interact at that point with the nucleus. It can if it has very high energy, but now uh, uh, in the range of the light and X-rays and gamma rays, it interacts with the outer electron shell of the atom. So it's an atomic interaction. You'll find that an incident gamma photon or X-ray photon can impart energy to some outer electron in the atom uh, throw it out, it ejects it, uh, uh, and in that case, the atom loses a unit of negative charge, so it becomes an ion, and that ion, of course, has to be positive with the same amount of positive charge as the charge of the electron that is ejected. Uh, conservation of mass and momentum, in that case, apply like in mechanics, and you notice that the electron is ejected and the atom is left with some recoil energy uh, in an excited energy state. Uh, the photoelectric uh, process is a very important process because uh, it's used in photoelectric cells in uh, some uh, version, or oh, actually on the uh, phones on our cameras, this is automatic now, but you could see that uh, at dusk, uh, lights in the streets uh, turn themselves on by uh, the effect of using photocells. When uh, the photocell uh, discovers that uh, the, uh, the level of lighting is decreasing, it turns on the street lights uh, and uh, lights uh, in, on around farmsteads or homes uh, automatically in general. Uh, something that is not very well known is that uh, Albert Einstein's PhD uh, was not related to uh, the uh, E is equal to MC square equation, the mass and energy equivalence equation. It was uh, related to uh, the photoelectric effect. So uh, a photon of low energy can basically eject an electron. All the energy of the photon in that case is uh, lost to the ejected electron and the recoil energy of the atom. So that is the first way that interaction uh, happens. Uh, and uh, uh, notice that the probability of that reaction is discovered by what we call the cross-section for the photoelectric effect. And it is uh, proportional uh, to the atomic number of the nucleus that it is interacting with. So the higher the atomic number, uh, for instance, uh, iron or uranium uh, would uh, 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 exhibit more of the photoelectric effect. And interestingly enough, it's inversely proportional to the energy of the photon H nu. So in that case, if you look at the probability of interactions that we'll describe later as the mass attenuation coefficient, you find that uh, low, a low energy photon, this is the axis for energy here, uh, can uh, exhibit that photoelectric effect with electron on the K shell or the L shells, uh, depending on the energy of the photon. The lower the energy, the higher uh, the uh, interaction uh, process, as you could see here. So that is uh, definitely goes against intuition, but in fact, it is a, uh, a, 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 a wave mechanics or a quantum mechanical uh, effect. All right, so this is the first uh, way that uh, uh, photons of light or 
gamma or X-rays can uh, interact. They interact with the atom, but but very highly energetic photons, in fact, can also interact with the nucleus. And uh, this is what we are going to call the photonuclear effect. Very high gamma rays can lead to nuclear reactions by interacting with the nucleus. And uh, some isotopes, in fact, uh, are sources of very, very energetic uh, gamma photons. Like in boiling water reactors, you'll find that the neutrons interact with the oxygen uh, uh, in the water uh, produce an isotope of nitrogen, 7 nitrogen 16, that emits a very highly energetic gamma photon, 6.1 million electron volts. And uh, uh, it has, though, a very short half life, 7.1 uh, second. And it affects the operation of boiling water reactors because the so steam, in that case, uh, under the operation uh, of uh, a boiling water reactor that we'll see later. Uh, would be radioactive, so personnel's uh, access to the, uh, the uh, steam uh, 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 and the generator room uh, would be limited. However, it decays very rapidly, so a minute or so after the uh, reactor is shut down, access to uh, the turbine plant, the electrical part of the plant is simply available. In nature, uh, solium-208 happens in the decay uh, curves of uh, uranium-238, 235. In the future, if you use uh, 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 fast reactors, the coolant could be sodium, and sodium-24 uh, also can emit very powerful gamma rays, 2.75 million electron volt of uh, energy. So those gamma rays are available to interact with other materials. For instance, in uh, what we are going to call heavy water reactors, the Kendu type that the Canadians have uh, developed, the gamma photons can interact with the deuterium in the water. And in water, the deuterium isotope to the hydrogen isotope on Earth is 160 parts per million. So you find that neutrons are released and uh, hydrogen, uh, the, uh, basically it splits the deuterium into a neutron and a hydrogen. So we consider the deuteron basically as a composite particle of a neutron and a hydrogen uh, nucleus uh, uh, in general. So this is an important reaction in uh, that type of reactor that uses heavy water as a coolant. Another photonuclear reaction is uh, uh, when gamma photons act on the beryllium-9 uh, isotope, and uh, uh, it has a very low, low threshold energy. So if the photon has an energy of 1.67 million electron volts, it can split, <laughs> literally split, the beryllium-9 nucleus. So gamma plus beryllium-9 uh, gives us a neutron, and beryllium-8 is generated by balancing the equation. 4 and plus comes 4 here, and 9 comes 8 plus 1. But the beryllium-9 uh, decays, uh, in fact, splits into two alpha particles. So in that case, a gamma photon can fission, literally fission uh, the beryllium-9 isotope by producing two alpha particles and a neutron. So in that case, uh, it happens so fast that the whole reaction, you don't see even the beryllium-8. Uh, 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 it happens within 10 to minus 14 seconds into two alpha particles. So the beryllium-9 uh, is disintegrating uh, in that case. Uh, so these reactions, uh, obviously, uh, if you have these gamma photons, we can uh, uh, create those types of interactions. Uh, there are reactions also in particle accelerators where we can generate very powerful gamma rays. For instance, if you have a proton accelerator and you hit a target of lithium-7, you'll find that you produce that beryllium-8 that we mentioned earlier, and you get the gamma photons. And the gamma ray energies can be extremely large, uh, about uh, 15 million, even 17.6 million electron volt. Or the proton from a particle accelerator can interact with boron-11 and produce carbon-12 with 16 million electron volt gamma Photons. Uh, a proton accelerator on tritium could produce alpha particles uh, plus 19.8 uh, million electron volts of gamma ray photons. So uh, the photonuclear reaction, unfortunately, is not listed uh, as a valid reaction in the textbooks. Uh, so uh, we have to uh, include it here to, for completeness. And, uh, uh, and uh, uh, so we have to study it. Now, uh, there are uh, ways of uh, uh, generating neutron sources uh, for many different applications. 
where you need uh, sources. For instance, you can use neutrons to kill a soft tissue cancer in the brain. So in that case, uh, uh, neutrons are uh, generated uh, by having radium. You get a, uh, the isotope of radium-226. Uh, it's metallic plus separate beryllium. Uh, the radium uh, emits uh, gamma photons. The gamma photon in that case interacts with the beryllium-9 isotope, and you end up with very energetic neutron energies. You can get a neutron yield of about 1 million per disintegration. Or you can have radium with a separate heavy water. Uh, the isotope of deuterium in that case uh, interacts with the gamma photon from the emission of gamma rays from the radium isotope. And uh, you produce a, an ion of hydrogen and uh, uh, neutrons are generated. Uh, you can mix beryllium with sodium-24. Sodium-24, as we said, emits very powerful gamma rays. The gamma rays can interact with the beryllium and uh, produce basically that disintegration uh, or fission of the uranium, if you, uh, or the beryllium, if you want to call it, uh, two alpha particles. Uh, the gamma rays also from sodium-24 can interact with deuterium. Uh, heavy water, D2O, this is like H2O, but the H replaced by D, so that's what we are going to call the heavy water. Uh, the gamma photon interacts with the deuterium producing hydrogen plus a neutron. So these are all neutron sources here uh, with yttrium and serbium. Uh, 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 gamma emitting isotopes can be used to produce sources uh, of neutrons. Could be actinium, lanthanum, 140, uh, uh, producing a gamma photon. Again, the gamma photon can interact with the beryllium D2O, beryllium, or D D2O. So this is uh, what we call the photonuclear reaction. The interesting thing also that is not listed in the textbooks is that if the gamma photon energy is higher than those energies that cause those photonuclear reactions, they can lead to photofission. They can fission a nuclei. For instance, uh, if uh, you get high energy protons uh, and bombard the uh, calcium fluoride, you'll find that you can get gamma rays of 6.3 million electron volts of uh, energy. And uh, gamma photons uh, uh, at high energy can uh, cause fission in different heavy nuclides. So if uh, uh, the gamma photon has an energy above 5.4 million electron volts, this is called the photofission threshold. Uh, on thorium-230, you can fission uh, the thorium-230. Uh, you can fission the uranium-233, 235, 238, as well as plutonium by photon exceeding uh, the thresholds energies for, uh, uh, for the uh, fission process. So you could see here that uh, we have two processes, photonuclear and photofission, that can happen with gamma rays. And uh, they are not really listed in all the textbooks. Uh, uh, most of the textbooks uh, emphasize the, pho uh, the photoelectric effect that we covered so far, as well as the Compton scattering and the pair production process. In Compton scattering, you'll find this happens over a different range of the energy of uh, the photons. And I'll show you just a diagram in that case. Notice that in the photoelectric effect, an electron is ejected and the rest of the energy goes to the recoil nucleus. In the Compton scattering process, you'll find that the gamma photon comes in, interact with an outer electron uh, bound electron, ejects the electron like in the photoelectric effect, but the energy of the photon is not fully absorbed into uh, the atom. And because now the photon has lost some of its energy, you'll find that it emerges with a lower energy. And lower energy means a larger uh, here uh, 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 wave length. So we are showing the incident gamma photon with high frequency, meaning the short wave length. And uh, now the wavelength has increased. Uh, and uh, this is a way of uh, shielding against gamma rays, obviously, because an energetic gamma photon here with a high frequency becomes a gamma photon with a lower uh, a frequency uh, or a lot longer uh, wavelengths. Uh, so Compton scattering is a second process by which gamma rays interact with matter in the applications, uh, in uh, uh, today's applications. And if you look at the diagram of the attenuation coefficients of gamma rays when they interact with matter, you'll find that the Compton scattering occurs over a large range 
of energy of the photon. But at low energy, you'll find the photoelectric effect uh, being larger than the Compton uh, scattering. Uh, in intermediate energy of one million electron volt, this is how uh, what uh, happens if lead is used as uh, material interacting with the gamma photon. You find that the photoelectric effect here and the Compton scattering are comparable. So these are uh, two uh, processes, uh, four processes now of gamma rays interaction uh, with uh, matter. Uh, the photonuclear, the photofission, uh, the, uh, uh, pair, the, the photoelectric as well as the Compton uh, scattering. All right, that's uh, not the only processes. Obviously the Compton scattering uh, the same as the, uh, the uh, uh, photoelectric effect is higher, uh, the higher the uh, Z uh, of, the, uh, uh, of the, uh, the isotope uh, of interest. Uh, you notice here that there is a cross-section or a probability of interaction for the Compton scattering that is proportional to Z. So if you use say uh, uranium or you use lead, uh, high Z elements, you can shield against gamma rays. Uh, we can uh, tell also that if you want to shield against neutrons, uh, you'll uh, use uh, low energy, uh, low, low Z number isotopes like the paraffin wax would contain lots of carbon atoms and, uh, and uh, this would be better at uh, slowing down the and protons. Uh, that would be the best for slowing down uh, or shielding against neutrons, whereas he heavy elements uh, are used to shield against the gamma rays and X-rays. If you go to a hospital for an X-ray, uh, they'll give you some kind of uh, uh, a blanket that would cover uh, your uh, uh, sensitive parts like the eyes and the brain and uh, uh, different organs uh, to protect you against the scattering of the x-rays uh, to other parts of the body. One important interaction that has to do with what we mentioned earlier about the equivalence of mass to energy is the positron electron pair production and we covered that uh, also in the previous chapter. When the energy of a gamma photon uh, shown here in a cloud chamber, this would be a gamma photon coming this way. If the energy exceeds the mass of two electrons, uh, the mass of the electron is 0.51 million electron volt, uh, we find a very interesting process happening where now electromagnetic radiation, the gamma photon turns into two particles. One is an electron, and an electron has a negative charge. So there is a magnetic field that is superimposed on the page perpendicular to the page. You'll find that the electrons, uh, charged particles in general, uh, move around the magnetic field line. So that could be an electron uh, 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 moving around the magnetic field line that is perpendicular to the page. But at the same time, you find another uh, path here. This is the uh, uh, condensation uh, like, uh, like the contrails that planes show up in the upper atmosphere when they exhaust the uh, steam from burning, say, the kerosene that they use as a fuel, you'll find that you have another particle forming at the same time that goes in the opposite direction. So this is the positron. Uh, the positron is the antimatter of the electron. The electron can survive much longer in our universe, but that positron ends up meeting uh, an electron and uh, a process called annihilation happens. Uh, the, the, uh, the positron now loses its energy to small to two gamma photons. And in that case, uh, the, uh, the process of annihilation is one way of shielding against gamma rays uh, in general. So you'll see that uh, uh, this is an experiment that anybody can conduct. I think the physics students show it on engineering open house, uh, uh, all you need is some uh, saturated uh, uh, vapor of a liquid like uh, alcohol. Uh, so you place a cylinder with a glass top, you impose a magnetic field perpendicular to the page, and you could see here a source of radiation emitting gamma photons, and you could see the tracks of the particles uh, in the, uh, as condensation trails in the saturated vapor. Same as the contrails of airplanes when they exhaust their fuel uh, 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 exhaust up uh, in, in that case, a saturated vapor uh, uh, up 
in the atmosphere when it's uh, uh, rather uh, cold. So uh, that's uh, uh, another important process by which we can shield against gamma rays. The condition for the occurrence of that process is that basically the energy uh, of the photon uh, should uh, uh, be uh, larger than two electron masses because we assume that the proton uh, is uh, equal to uh, the mass of the uh, positron is uh, almost equal to the mass of the uh, electron. So the minimum energy for that process or H nu minimum is two electron masses. Uh, the electron mass is equivalent to 0.51 million electron volt. So that process only happens when the energy of the photons are larger than 1.02 million electron volt. Uh, in the same way as the other two processes, you'll find that the pair production probability of interaction, we are going to call it the cross section because it has units of centimeter squared, is proportional in that case to Z squared, the square of the charge. So if we uh, want to shield against gamma rays, we go back to our uh, initial diagram here, you could see that uh, as a function of energy of the photon, when it exceeds here that threshold of 1.02 million electron volt, you find that the pair production process happens. The interesting thing is that the three processes depend on the energy of the photon. So if you have, say, a photon at 1 million electron volts of energy interacting with lead, uh, well, obviously, the it is not above the one or two, so the uh, pair production would not occur, but you get a contribution from the uh, Compton scatter, the photoelectric effect here, as well as the Compton scattering, and they add up. So the three processes add up uh, for photons of different energy, and there is an optimal value here, or a minimum. We call this the window uh, of the shielding material. So photons that have that energy here, like uh, three million electron volt basically can leak through the lead preferentially to photons that have a higher energy or uh, lower energy. In that case, when we use shielding against gamma rays, we would like to close that window. How do we close that window? We don't use just uh, lead for shielding, but use some other materials like iron maybe and aluminum, a high Z element obviously. Uh, and uh, in that case, they have different minima or different windows and we can shield uh, against gamma rays. Uh, gamma rays can penetrate up to one meter of concrete. That's uh, uh, energy, some energy applications. All right, now this is electromagnetic radiation. So these are not, in fact, <coughs> the only processes by which gamma rays interact with matter. If you go to the nuclear engineering textbooks, they only mention three main, they are main processes, obviously, they mentioned the positron electron pair production. They mentioned the uh, photoelectric effect they, and they mentioned uh, Compton scattering. But we see here that there are other processes. We mentioned the photonuclear process and the photofission process. Remember that gamma rays is basically electromagnetic radiation. So it also behaves in the same way uh, as electromagnetic radiation in general, like light for instance, or microwaves. So in that case, you find that it can also interact with the atoms. It's an atomic process in that case of what's called Rayleigh scattering. Uh, light uh, or gamma photons can interact with any atom by having an instant gamma photon. Uh, it basically imparts some of its energy to the atom. So you get a recoil uh, uh, atom, uh, but there is no ionization. There is no uh, release of the energy of that electron because the uh, the binding energy is uh, higher than the energy of the incident photon. So what happened in that case is that the un uh, incident gamma photon can just uh, lose some of its energy uh, to the recoil uh, uh, atom, the whole atom, and uh, loses some energy there. The frequency of the light in that case, or the gamma photon decreases a little bit. There is also another process uh, called the Thomson scatter. Uh, our interest uh, in the, the production of power is that uh, nuclear reactions like fission uh, uh, or fusion, in fact, too, produce gamma radiation. It's very penetrating, so we must find ways, engineering-wise, to shield against it. And uh, since we said that the three processes of interest 
of greatest interest, the, uh, the uh, photoelectric effect, the content scattering and the pair production, all are proportional to the value of the atomic number. So we shield against gamma radiation by using elements uh, that have a high atomic number. And that's the origin of the lead shield that you use when you get an X-rays. It's uh, uh, lead, uh, has a high Z, is a high Z element, it contains lots of electrons. And uh, you want those three processes that you mentioned to interact with the uh, electrons. So in that case, uh, we combine the three probabilities of interaction. Uh, the one for the content scattering, the cross-section as we're going to call it, plus the one for the photoelectric effect, plus the one for the pair production for a photon of a given uh, energy. And as I suggested, you get the transparency windows for different materials. For lead, it happens in the, di in the diagram that I've shown you at 3 million electron volts. With copper, it happens at 10 million electron volts. For aluminum, at 22 million electron volts. So a shield that is going to shield against a large range of the gamma photons would be a combination of those different uh, elements. All right, so let us assume that each event uh, leads to the removal of uh, one photon from a beam of photons. You'll find that if you have a thickness X of a material uh, and uh, you multiply that by uh, the, uh, the, uh, the total cross-section or the sum of the probabilities of interactions uh, of the Compton scattering, the photoelectric and the pair production. I'm saying that these are the three processes that are listed in the textbooks because uh, the photo fission and the photonuclear processes do happen, but they happen at very, very high energy. And the other processes like the Rayleigh scattering and Thomson scattering, on the other hand, occur at very low energy. So they ignore them. They take the range of energies of uh, gamma photons that are uh, met in the production of nuclear power, the Compton scattering, photoelectric and pair production. So now we have centimeters uh, squared multiplied into uh, 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 a thickness X of a material, you'll find that the beam of, of neutrons incident on a thickness X of a material decays exponentially. It uh, loses its intensity. Uh, this would be the intensity of the beam. Uh, it decreases exponentially. And uh, here, the argument of any exponential uh, should be uh, uh, basically uh, uh, dimensionless. So if this is centimeter and this is centimeter squared, it has to cancel with centimeter cube. So in that case, that n prime here, the number of atoms per centimeter cube uh, is needed in the exponent of the negative exponential, which is really an attenuation of the beam. How do we calculate that n prime? We use the modified form of Avogadro's law. So we call it here n prime. Instead of using the mass of the material, we use the density of the material. So that n prime is calculated for different material. Uh, that would be the density in grams per centimeter cube multiplied into Avogadro's number divided into the molecular weight of the material that we are using. Uh, when you combine that n prime number per centimeter cube into uh, uh, the uh, sigma total, the uh, cross section uh, in centimeter squared, you get units of one over centimeter. So that's per centimeter cube. This is centimeter squared. It's one over centimeter. So uh, the law of attenuation of gamma photons exponentially becomes the initial intensity multiplied into a negative exponential where the thickness of the material is up there and uh, multiplied into uh, what we call the attenuation uh, coefficient. Since it depends on the density of the material, another form <coughs> of that equation is by taking mu over the density and calling it the mass attenuation uh, coefficient. So in that case, you have here now uh, an equation where you multiply into the density and uh, multiply by that mass attenuation coefficient. That mass attenuation coefficient is tabulated uh, for different materials. And uh, this is now coming back to our original graph here. This is a mass attenuation coefficient mu over rho in centimeter squared per gram for photons of lead. So you could see here, uh, if you have a photon of lead at 1 million electron volt, you can tell what's the total attenuation uh, coefficient. And you can 
get the total attenuation coefficient, plug into that attenuation law, and you can get how much you attenuate your beam of gamma radiation. So let's go back here. So for the uh, attenuation law, and we can design a shield uh, that would shield personnel uh, against uh, gamma radiation. You notice that uh, for some energies of the gamma photons, uh, we have in that case, uh, a multiplication of the number of photons. For instance, if you have the pair production, you are generating a positron, the positron in our universe. Some people speculate there may be other universes that are primarily antimatter, uh, but let's stay within our universe here. You'll find that uh, in our universe, the positron uh, meets with an electron and needleates into two photons. So we can produce more photons, uh, but at lower energy as we are shielding against that initial intensity of gamma ray photons, number of photons crossing unit area per unit time. So in that case, we have to account for that uh, generation of extra photons by what we call the build up factor. So the equation uh, adds that B here, which depends on the energy of the photon and the thickness itself the, uh, of the material multiplied into the attenuation coefficient. So B, the uh, uh, build up factor is the actual gamma ray flux divided by the flux obtained using expo the exponential attenuation law. So for gamma rays, the attenuation of a beam of uh, uh, intensity, uh, number of photons crossing unit area per unit time, that's what we call the beam intensity, is the initial intensity multiplied by the attenuation coefficient. It's tabulated for different materials at different energies and different thicknesses of materials uh, multiplied by e to the minus mu x. However, uh, this is not uh, the, uh, the equation that you can use in the design of a shield. When we design a shield, we want to determine what is x that would lead to an attenuation of the beam, i of x over i naught, in the range of say one millionth or even one billionth times, 10 to the tens even, uh, the intensity of the beam of radiation. And we want to determine x. Uh, in that case, it becomes what's called in uh, uh, mathematical physics, uh, the process of an inverse kind of uh, type of uh, uh, law, uh, uh, and we want to determine x. The same way that uh, if you have sonar for ships, you are not interested in the attenuation of the uh, sonar beam, you are interested in the distance between the ship, say, and the submarine, or the depths of the water in a lake or the ocean. And uh, same from radar, you are not interested in how your radar beam is attenuated, you want to know really what is the distance between the radar uh, emitter and the plane. So we really want to solve for X in that equation. And this is a problem uh, that is known as the inverse problem of mathematical physics. All right, so let us find a way of getting what is that X here. First step is that we take that I note and bring it to the left side. So now that becomes the beam after it interacts with a material with a an attenuation coefficient mu uh, relative to its intensity. We call this the attenuation factor. And that could be one in a million, 10 to the minus six, or 10 to the minus nine, one in a billion. And uh, the B could be two or three, depending, or sometimes one, depending on uh, the energy of the photons here. Uh, well, we want to solve for X. So we bring that B to this side, and we have now the attenuation divided into the, uh, uh, build a factor and to get rid of any exponential we are going to take the natural logarithm of both sides uh, if you take the lo natural logarithm of an exponential you get the argument of the exponential which is minus mu x so minus mu x now is minus the natural logarithm of i of x divided into b i naught and then you can solve in that last step for x it becomes minus one over mu uh, the at mass attenuation coefficient, uh, and you can calculate the uh, thickness of the uh, uh, material that is going to shield uh, uh, your persons or animals against the intensity of radiation I of X. So this is important uh, whether you, uh, um, you are working in a hospital in an X-ray department, uh, or if you are working in a nuclear reactor or a nuclear submarine, 
and you want to take a thickness of a material lead, for instance, that would attenuate your gamma rays by a factor of one million or uh, actually the design feature uses the most is 10 to the minus 10, 10 billion times attenuation. Uh, I'll give you a problem along this line uh, for uh, maybe the eyes that I think if we go to the, uh, uh, the exercises at the end of the chapter, uh, you I want you to compare lead to water to concrete uh, with different linear attenuation coefficient for gamma photon of one million electron volt compared to thickness of concrete that would reduce, say, the beam intensity by uh, uh, a factor of one million or a factor of one billion. Uh, you find obviously that the higher the mass attenuation coefficient, uh, the lead, for instance, uh, you'll get a better attenuation than concrete. For concrete, uh, to attenuate a gamma photon at one million electron volt, you need basically almost uh, a meter of uh, concrete uh, in general. All right, so if we are going to talk about gamma rays, we want to learn more about gamma rays in uh, nature and uh, 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 some interesting observations that uh, affect our livelihood. <coughs> and uh, 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 maybe the uh, future of humanity. Uh, remember uh, in the Fermi paradox, uh, cosmologists suggest that humanity has to overcome uh, hurdles or filters. Uh, uh, to survive. So we have to be aware of how the universe around us <laughs> operates uh, so that our uh, technological civilization can endure and, uh, uh, and overcome those filters. Uh, people discovered recently by 2005 uh, by, uh, from a, a swift uh, satellite launched by NASA that a huge blast happened and that lasted 200 seconds on September 4th, 2005. And that satellite was launched in 2004. <coughs> and uh, on December 27, 2004, it detected a huge gamma rays burst. And those gamma ray bursts occur in different parts of the universe. Uh, this is uh, a picture actually taken uh, by uh, the satellite of the smoldering atmosphere surrounding the gamma rays burst. Uh, gamma rays bursts are very distant from the Earth, so uh, basically they haven't affected us uh, through the history of the Earth, but it can sterilize, literally sterilize a whole galaxy. <coughs> and luckily for us, uh, it's first uh, far away. It happened in the past, obviously, since it's far away, the speed of light uh, takes time to reach us, but uh, uh, it's also directional, so... <coughs> the farther away, the less uh, there is a probability that it will hit us. But it can sterilize a whole side of the Earth if it's facing it uh, in general. So that is uh, a topic of interest for cosmologists and space uh, uh, people who study space phenomena. Uh, what is, uh, how does a gamma rays burst uh, happen? Uh, basically every day, uh, we can see some of those uh, gamma rays bursts illuminate the sky. And they come from random direction from the universe and have to become the target of intense research and study by both cosmologists and uh, astronomers uh, in general. Uh, how do this, uh, this uh, uh, gamma rays burst? There are different uh, models for it. Uh, one model that I suggest is uh, the situation where uh, in, uh, a, in a supernova, maybe a cusp configuration happens. So what is a cusp configuration? Uh, assume that you have a wire uh, getting into the, uh, the plane of the page, uh, that wire comes in here, and you find that if you run a current through that wire, you generate a magnetic field around it in the direction of the right hand of your fingers. Then, bring the wire back again from behind the page towards us, and you get another magnetic field that interacts with the other magnetic field, then bring it in back again in, uh, this is called the Iofi bars, uh, to the other side and bring it back again from the other side and you get a, comp a, a magnetic field configuration that looks like cusp like this. This is called the cusp. In that case, if you have a plasma in the center and plasma would be stellar matter, uh, the laws of magnetohydrodynamics tell us that if you have a zero magnetic field 
and the magnetic fields here, as you could see, canceled. And at the very, very center, <coughs> you get a zero magnetic field. And uh, a particle caught in that part of the cusp at uh, the zero magnetic field, B equal to zero, theoretically, according to the laws of magnetohydrodynamics, it can uh, acquire an, uh, an infinite velocity. So in that case, that could be a way of those <coughs> gamma rays burst happen, uh, generating particles that can reach us with extremely high energies. Uh, that is also a way of generating a plasma configuration for those of us studying plasmas, uh, maybe our electrical engineers or our nuclear engineers uh, to generate a very stable plasma. Instead of using maybe the Iofis bar, you can have <clears throat> two coils, one on the top and one at the bottom here, and you can get a plasma configuration that is stable against disruptions. Uh, and uh, uh, there is another model. Uh, <clears throat> again, I'll show you the equations here, the magnetohydrodynamic equations. Uh, basically, if the particle is caught in the center, <clears throat> uh, the velocity, it's called the Alphine velocity, can reach uh, infinity. Uh, so that's also a way of generating a particle uh, weapon that can have particles moving at extremely high energies. Uh, this, there is an, a model uh, that was uh, developed by the German scientists in which they suggest something similar that two magnetic fields are collapsing into each other. And you could see that that cusp configuration happens in a different way. And that would accelerate the particles to those infinite uh, velocities. Uh, so <clears throat> uh, uh, gamma ray bursts can, are of great interest because if one of them, uh, God forbid, hits the Earth, uh, we uh, be basically that could be an extinction event. Uh, an interesting observation uh, uh, lately about gamma rays is uh, that uh, people thought that uh, lightning strike occur from uh, the cloud uh, to uh, the ground to the Earth, uh, but again with satellites uh, occurrence and uh, planes flying up in the sky. <clears throat> they discovered that uh, uh, particle uh, electrons can also propagate up into the upper atmosphere above the clouds. And in that case, these uh, 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 very fast electrons uh, generate uh, X-rays that have energies in the million electron volt. And uh, as you know, like when electrons lose their energy through the Bremsstrahlung process, uh, Bremsstrahlung comes from the German Bremsen rays strahlung radiation, or, uh, <clears throat> or uh, in that case, like breaking radiation, uh, you find that uh, in thunderstorms, uh, we didn't know it, but in thunderstorms, in fact, uh, we can be subject to uh, uh, gamma rays. So it's a good idea to stay indoors in a thunderstorm. Yes, you get the lightning from the cloud to the ground, but then the runaway electrons are going up into the atmosphere. They generate an electric field coming down. Uh, this is B, the magnetic field, as well as an electric field. That the magnetic field, uh, the electrons move around the magnetic field up away from the atmosphere. But as they slow down, uh, you get gamma rays generated and uh, a strong electric field goes to, towards the ground. So. Uh, thunderstorms are not associated just with the danger or the risk of lightning, but you're also subjected to uh, gamma rays uh, from the accelerated electrons. We didn't know about these things until uh, very uh, recently, as a matter uh, of fact. So stay indoors <laughs> during thunderstorms to avoid, avoid getting a dose of uh, radiation. Uh, uh, following this, in 1994, they also observed uh, that uh, there are other phenomena associated with thunderstorms. And uh, let me list some uh, of those other than the, uh, the uh, runaway electrons. Uh, uh, one of them is uh, what, that they are really have names now. Uh, and uh, you can only observe this if you are in a satellite like the uh, International Space Station. And uh, this is phenomena that happen be above the troposphere. The troposphere is where the weather phenomena occurs. This is what like yesterday or the day before, uh, you could see the cumulus nimbus growing up into the troposphere. And then 
lightning can happen between those clouds and the earth, the discharge in general. However, uh, uh, people in the space station started and air airplanes that are flying above the troposphere discovered that there are also what they call blue jets uh, uh, originating from the top of the cloud. They may have to do with the runaway electrons to a certain degree, but even if you go up even higher, uh, 50 kilometers in height in the mesosphere and the ionosphere, you get some other processes that have been observed lately and are left for the study of those who are inquisitive among you, you get sprites. And uh, the blue jets are blue in color, the sprites are red in color, and they generate what they call elves. So here, when you go up to the ionosphere of great interest to our electrical engineers, because that's where basically radio waves reflect from and communication with satellites uh, would be positioned. Then you get, uh, other than the blue jets, you get the sprites and the elves, and uh, uh, you get tendrils, uh, and uh, we didn't know about this until in the uh, until like uh, two decades or so uh, ago. And so we know about this phenomena by basically observation from the International Space uh, Station. Uh, so it's left for inquiries. Uh, this is not pie in the sky. This is an actual blue jets. You could see it uh, by uh, uh, taken by a satellite by NASA from the top of the cloud formation, uh, other than uh, it is not obviously something going to the ground, which would be uh, the lightning that uh, we can see in between the clouds. And if you go up higher, look here, this is an actual picture also of the sprites that are red, some kind uh, in color, uh, and they originate also in uh, thunderstorms. And uh, uh, even people uh, took picture of what they call jellyfish sprites they go up from the cloud and down from uh, the cloud in general uh, another aspect of gamma rays that we are studying today here is the fact that uh, some people suggest that our galaxy uh, the milky way galaxy or other galaxies this would be uh, cut out through it will be on one of the arms of the galaxy that at the center of the galaxy we have a black hole and uh, that black hole is uh, as two uh, bubbles on top and at the bottom of it, uh, which they call the gamma ray bubbles. And they consider it as a way uh, of, this, of associated with the black hole at the center of the Milky Way galaxy. And uh, so far then we know that uh, gamma rays are associated with every day life. Some people suggest that the gamma rays bursts are associated with neutron stars colliding. Neutron stars are remnants of stars that have used up all their fusion energy and now they become very small the size of the earth maybe uh, and uh, they are, they are uh, uh, made out only of uh, neutrons. Uh, of interest to us in our livelihood as engineers uh, uh, we need to learn how to shield against gamma radiation knowing the different methods and the different materials so I'll give you a problem today of uh, basically solving that problem uh, 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 at the end of uh, the chapter uh, in, in general. All right, I'll stop sharing and uh, open up the chat room uh, for any uh, possible. Uh, okay, thank you, uh, Anshal. Uh, so uh, we covered the three forces of nature now, and uh, we covered applications of radioactive theory like food preservation by radiation. I'll put a new sign right there. Uh, something interesting that has to do with uh, radioactive processes or the weak force is uh, one of the methods by which we uh, produce uh, energy, which is geothermal energy. Uh, notice that uh, life on Earth uh, is dependent on uh, radiation that we get from our stars, the sun. Uh, light uh, creates photosynthesis and, of course, is the basis of uh, life for plants and animals uh, in general. But uh, what uh, we are not aware of uh, 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 in general is that under our feet, uh, there is also radioactivity in the earth. And uh, I want to make the point that uh, without radioactivity from our stars or sun, uh, from the nuclear reaction, sorry, from our stars or sun, uh, 
and uh, the radioactivity under our feet, uh, we could not exist as a life uh, form. So uh, the Earth's crust uh, is uh, uh, composed of different materials of different concentration. Uh, primarily, the center of the Earth is where the heavy elements like iron and nickel have kind, some kind of concentrated. Uh, iron and nickel are heavy elements. So if they are heavy elements, they contain lots of electrons. They are high Z elements in that case. And the Earth rotates. And we know that the center of the Earth is a solid, solid iron and nickel uh, from uh, following the waves from earthquakes and uh, being able to tell what is the composition of the Earth. Uh, the core of the Earth is solid, but is surrounded around it by a molten core. And uh, the molten core rotates. Now you have a molten material uh, uh, rotating iron and nickel containing electrons. So if you let electrons rotate in a circle, what do you generate? You generate a field, a magnetic field perpendicular to both of them. And uh, in that case, you find that that radioactivity also leads to uh, the magnetic field of the Earth protecting us from the solar wind. If we didn't have that magnetic field and it is caused by the existence of radioactivity in the Earth's crust, uh, the surface of the Earth would look like the surface of Mars. Uh, Mars uh, did, does not have enough radioactivity to generate a magnetic field Hence, <clears throat> it was not protected by the solar wind that evaporated any water that existed a long, long time ago. Mars has only a very localized magnetic field around Mount Pons, which is the highest peak in the solar system uh, in, in general. So uh, uh, on Earth, <clears throat> uh, the radioactivity in the Earth's crust <clears throat> causes the uh, uh, some of the material of the Earth to remain molten. And as it remains molten, it creates uh, lava, and lava can be exhausted by uh, volcanoes, volcanic areas. Uh, geothermal energy uh, has existed in uh, 24 countries that uh, where 60 million people get their power from the Earth's heat. Iceland, for instance, uh, has so much uh, 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 tectonic activity uh, that all their electricity is generated by uh, geothermal power coming from radioactivity in uh, the Earth's crust. So the Earth, in fact, is uh, from that perspective, a power generator. We know about it from different experiments. One of them is the liquid scintillator anti-neutrino detector, uh, Kamland in Japan, shown here. But uh, our knowledge about uh, the composition of the Earth uh, depends on how it was formed. Uh, it was formed apparently as a result, uh, at least the theory tells us, uh, as a result of a, a supernova explosion uh, that happened to a star uh, 4.6 billion years ago. Now the age of the universe that we think, uh, which is really the most distant light that we can see from the stars is 13.7 billion years. So that supernova uh, uh, created debris, and the debris are have been caught through the gravitational force by our sun, and uh, we are part of that uh, phenomenon that happened uh, billions of years ago. If you look at the composition of the elements in the universe, definitely we could see that the. Uh, let me uh, show the whole graph here. Uh, this is according to the mass number. The uh, uh, abundance of different elements in the universe relative to silicon. Silicon would be uh, one million right here. You find that magnesium, ne ne neon, uh, carbon, helium, and hydrogen are, for instance, hydrogen here is uh, 10,000 times more abundant in the universe than silicon. Silicon is, uh, occurs in silicon dioxide, which is sand. Uh, iron also is very uh, common at the same abundance as silicon. And then we have all these other rare elements like uh, uh, lead and uh, uh, mercury, hafnium, dysprosium, uh, and so on. But so our universe is primarily uh, hydrogen uh, nuclei. Uh, the interstellar medium uh, uh, is composed of what is called the solar nebula. 
And I think uh, this last week we have been having a visitor, a comet that came to us from what's called the Kuiper Belt. The Kuiper Belt are very, very far objects from the Earth. And uh, we get visited by comets from the Kuiper Belt. And uh, we get a very short notice about those comets uh, coming to us. So you'll find that uh, uh, we have uh, planetesimals like Pluto at some point was considered a planet, now just considered as an object. And uh, you'll find that uh, 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 radioactive materials were formed in that process and are part of the uh, solid uh, planets, in that case, like, like the uh, Earth and like Mars. The distances in our, uh, to the Kuiper belt, uh, where comets come to the Earth and can cause mass extinctions. In fact, uh, like the asteroids are surrounding the Earth in between Mars and Jupiter. So that's the asteroid belt. Any two objects hitting each other can send a projectile uh, that can cause extinction of uh, life on Earth. But the Cooper belt has comets and uh, they give us a very, very short notice. So uh, these are all uh, one of all these uh, hurdles that humanity has so far uh, overcome. The distances are large and they're measured in terms of one astronomical unit, which is the distance between the Earth and the sun. Okay, uh, this is an introduction uh, just about the formation of the Earth. Uh, the Earth uh, is not just composed of uh, hydrogen in the water, H2O in our oceans, they cover 70% of the sur surface of the Earth and uh, elements like silicon, like in sand and uh, calcium, uh, in uh, carbonate rock and uh, uh, nitrogen in the atmosphere and oxygen. But you'll find that uh, lots of naturally occurring isotopes that have long half-lives do exist on Earth. Uh, aluminum 26 here has a half-life of 7.3, 10 to the fifth years. And basically it was radioactive at the time of the creation of the Earth. And since then it has totally decayed. It doesn't exist anymore. Palladium 107 shown here also has six and a half million year half-life. These have uh, uh, disappeared and we know what's a half-life now. So we get a feel for it. However, some elements like vanadium-50 is radioactive, uh, but it has a half-life of 4, 10 to the 16th year, uh, 10 orders of magnitude higher than uh, the aluminum that has disappeared. And it still exists in the Earth's crust. Uh, cerium-142 has also a very long half-life. And uh, cerium is used as a, a rare Earth element for uh, basically in our TVs as a phosphor, as well as uh, uh, it has a very high hardness, so it's used for uh, 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 making lenses for uh, and uh, uh, grinding glass in general. Uh, these are not the only elements, uh, high uh, uh, elements that exist in the Earth's crust. Uh, one of them particularly is uh, uh, potassium-40. So let's see if we can find potassium-40. Uh, no, we don't have it in that list here, but potassium-40 in bismuth-209, and definitely we know that thorium-232 uh, has a half-life 2.9, 10 to the 10th year, and then we have the famous uranium-234, uranium-235, and uranium-238. They're all in the billions of years, for particularly 238 is 4.5 billion year half-life. So, and uh, thorium is, uh, has an even longer half-life, so that's why thorium in the Earth's crust is four times more abundant than that the uranium-238 uh, isotope. And it can become a source of energy that exceeds uh, the energy from uranium-238. So the Earth has radioactivity in it, uh, radioactive elements. And uh, these radioactive elements are decaying. So they're emitting radiation, alpha particles, eventually, in fact, in uh, gas fields, natural gas fields, are a source of helium. Oh, we use the helium in helium balloons, but helium is also used in cryogenics for magnetic resonance imaging, just say, uh, in uh, uh, hospitals type of or nuclear medicine applications. All right, so if we take the rate of emission of radioactivity from the radioactive isotopes in the Earth's crust, we can write for each one of them, uh, like they have a, 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 an uh, a, a, a number of nuclei uh, as a function of time, 
uh, we can describe that activity uh, as a modulus because it's a negative uh, value, obviously, because it's decreasing. But uh, for each element uh, that I've shown in the table, we get uh, an activity of lambda, the decay constant, natural logarithm of two divided into half-life, multiplied by the number of atoms at any time g. So that's transformations per second or at the unit of the Becquerel. Each one of those n of i is uh, following the radioactive decay law that we have uh, derived. If you multiply the number of atoms here, n of i in the activity equation by the energy release per disintegration, you find that now this is transformations per second multiplied into million electron volt per disintegration. So you end up with the power, the value of the power in million electron volt per second from each individual isotope. If we sum the energy or the power from all the radioactive isotopes, uh, P of I is lambda sub I N of I, you get uh, uh, basically power in million electron volts per second, which you can turn into uh, watts per second and megawatts or gigawatts per second. Uh, the integral energy release is obviously the integration of the power uh, from the time of the creation of the Earth to uh, today, any time capital T. So we substitute for the power, the summation over all the isotopes, and uh, you end up uh, basically that the energy release follows the sigmoid. It is increasing and reaching a saturation value of the time uh, uh, elapsed. We can use Avogadro's number here, Avogadro's law, to express all those Ni of zero as the mass of the isotopes divided into their molecular weight multiplied into Avogadro's number. And I can uh, describe really the energy release uh, in uh, the Earth's atmosphere over time from the time of its creation. Uh, you'll find that the decay of these elements is extremely slow for the most part, like uranium and thorium. Uh, however, a great quantity of heat is being generated in the process. And uh, some of that heat energy at the center of the Earth is being conducted uh, to the surface. And uh, we can measure this amount, and that's 25,000 gigajoule per second or gigawatts. A gigawatt uh, is a thousand watts. So, uh, uh, sorry, a megawatt is a million watts and the gigawatt is a thousand uh, megawatts. So it tells you basically that a huge uh, amount of energy, 25,000 uh, uh, gigawatt of power is being generated uh, in the earth from just radioactivity. And that would be if you take uh, 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 the power, total electrical power generation that we have on the earth now from coal and nuclear and everything, that's only 570 a gigawatt. Uh, if you say that a nuclear power plant or a coal power plant generates a thousand uh, megawatt, that's one gigawatt. So that's equivalent to 570 nuclear power plants or coal power plants. But look at the radioactivity from the Earth itself. That's 25,000 compared to uh, 570. So in that case, also although the surface of the Earth is maintained at low temperatures through radiation, the interior of the Earth remains molten due to the continuous heat generation. It's sobering to think now that uh, that uh, 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 heat generation under our Earth uh, is, uh, uh, occurs, of course, at the same time that the other heat source above our heads from our star, uh, the sun. But the heat generation in the Earth's crust has another effect. And uh, it basically generates a magnetic field that surrounds the Earth, as I suggested, the uh, core of the Earth is a solid material. Uh, uh, to our best knowledge, it's iron and nickel alloy, but it has a liquid outer layer and it's covered by the mantle. And then we have the crust here with our oceans and our land mass. The ocean covers 70% of the Earth's uh, surface. And uh, think of the crust here as being the uh, peeling on an apple. And that's where all life now exists, surrounded by the atmosphere uh, of the Earth. Now, the Earth is not uh, stable. It is rotating around a leaning axis at an angle 22 and a half degrees. And in that case, the liquid outer core is also rotating. The liquid outer core contains iron and nickel, molten iron and nickel. So that's now like electrons rotating at a very high speed. 
And as those electrons rotate at an extremely high speed in the outer core, a magnetic field is generated uh, uh, up uh, from the north to uh, the south. So what we call the North Pole, in fact, is uh, the South Pole. But this is a simulation that shows us how the Earth uh, rotating uh, uh, outer core generates a magnetic field. And the magnetic field uh, affects really the Earth's surface. So somebody might come someday with a theory that suggests that those magnetic field affect thunderstorms. Nobody has dared doing it yet, but this is how the magnetic field looks like. Uh, the magnetic field extends itself beyond the surface of the Earth. So the Earth now is a little ball here, and the magnetic field extends to very large distances away from the Earth. That magnetic field, as we know, protects us from the solar wind, because the solar wind will come in here from the sun. Uh, the Earth is a very tiny little ball there rotating around the sun. The sun is one million times the size of the Earth. So you'll find that that magnetic field uh, 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 interacts with the incoming solar wind. The solar wind is a mixture of electrons and protons. And one property of charged particles is that they rotate around the magnetic field lines. So if this is the Earth here, and this is the solar wind coming in, we have the magnetic field of the Earth around the Earth here from the north to the south. And uh, it uh, basically traps the, the particles uh, in the... Uh, it traps a particle from the solar wind. Otherwise, those particles will hit the Earth's ocean, the Earth's surface, they'll evaporate the ocean, they'll evaporate the atmosphere, and there won't be any life on Earth. So uh, radioactivity generating the Earth's magnetic field protects the Earth from the solar wind. And uh, we can say that we owe life from a nuclear process of fusion above our heads from our stars, the sun, as well as to radioactivity uh, occurring uh, in the Earth uh, uh, under our feet. Uh, the charged particles that are intercepted uh, from the solar wind into the Earth's magnetic field form two uh, toruses around the Earth. And that was discovered in the 1950s when they started sending rockets into the atmosphere. And uh, they take the shape of a torus on one side here and another one, an outer Van Allen belt of charged particles that are trapped in the Earth's magnetic field. And in that case, you can tell already that when we send satellites or we send spaceships, we have to, well, the, the, the astronauts have to go through uh, that uh, radiation, two, the two radiation belts, and, uh, but the, any geosynchronous orbit satellites have to be positioned outside the Earth's magnetic field. Uh, it takes that shape, uh, the particles uh, rotate around the magnetic field lines, so they appear on the top part of the Earth when uh, there is solar activity, and uh, you can go to the NASA site on space weather uh, and uh, when this activity happens in the sun. We are at a low point in the solar 11-year uh, cycle, uh, but uh, at, uh, at the high level of activity, when you see those sunspots, there are really magnetic fields, disturbances on the surface of the sun, sending those charged particles. So they rotate around the magnetic field lines of the Earth, and in the upper atmosphere, uh, they find their way down to the surface of the Earth. And that's what we call the aurora borealis, or the northern lights. At the southern uh, part of the Earth, they rotate around the magnetic field lines. They form a big ellipsoid here. And uh, this is what we call the aurora uh, Borealis, uh, Australis, uh, the southern part. So we have the northern, uh, uh, the, no the northern lights, and we have the southern lights. Uh, those particles that are not uh, facing the solar wind rotate around the magnetic field lines, and basically uh, they are thrown away from the Earth. So the Earth has its own protection uh, magnetic field due to the radioactivity uh, under our uh, field. So uh, without uh, that magnetic field and without radioactivity in the Earth materials, uh, then we would not have life on Earth. Basically, it would be a dead planet, maybe have some bacteria of life, uh, like what uh, uh, the uh, probes on Mars now are trying to discover. So uh, one aspect of the 
uh, the uh, Earth's magnetic field and the charge uh, uh, and the radioactivity in the Earth's crust is that uh, the solid core uh, contains uh, radioactivity that keeps it molten. And uh, if you dig into the Earth, like uh, when you dig for gold, maybe in South Africa in mines very deep, you'll find for each 100 meters you dig into the Earth, uh, surface, you temp your temperature increases by three degrees Celsius. So in that case, if the magma or the molten uh, rocks in the Earth are close to the surface of the Earth, that is an energy source. And this is what we call geothermal energy. So that ties up the process of radioactivity uh, to what we call by a name geothermal uh, energy. So uh, in fact, uh, uh, we know that uh, there are power flows in the Earth, uh, the terrestrial energy from conduction, uh, thermal conduction in the rocks is 310 to the 13 watts of power. That exceeds all the nuclear and coal and natural gas power plants and solar collectors or uh, uh, photovoltaics and so on. Tidal energy, uh, the tide between the, 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 between the moon and the Earth uh, has a level of 10 to the 12, 3, 10 to the 12 watts of power. Uh, solar radiation uh, uh, is a great amount, 10 to the 17s. Uh, wind waves, which is really converted solar energy, is 10 to the 14s. Uh, uh, and photosynthesis is that's the energy stored that eventually becomes coal or petroleum, is only 10 to the 13 from the large amount of solar radiation. Uh, 10 to the 13 watts of uh, power. So in that case, uh, uh, the Earth is generating, uh, is getting energy from above and energy from below. Uh, as we know, the, uh, the, the crust of the Earth is composed of plates that are moving around, but they also have friction. And when the, one of the plates, like the Pacific plate says, goes or subducts under the American plate, you'll find that along our west coast, we get the whole region and the west coast of South America, you get all uh, basically those uh, areas where you get volcanic eruption. Here in the United States, it happens maybe around Yellowstone too. Uh, around the Pacific Rim, uh, there is a whole big circle of this uh, uh, volcanic uh, type of uh, seismic events. And that's why the what surrounds the, the Pacific Ocean is called the Ring of Fire. Not to see if Japan uh, is part of the Ring of Fire and the tsunami that happened a few years ago affecting nuclear power plants there uh, happened as part of the seismic activity around uh, Japan. Uh, shown here in a different diagram, you could see that the Earth has areas where the uh, basically the friction between the tectonic plates uh, uh, and uh, uh, causes really, uh, like the Mediterranean area, for instance, is known for its, uh, and the uh, Pacific region around Indonesia and uh, uh, Japan there, uh, all are very known for their seismic activity. Uh, and uh, in that case, of course, uh, there are also a source uh, of energy. That seismic activity comes from the tectonic plates, as you could see here, rubbing against each other and uh, the rubbing, uh, you can call it uh, friction, to be more exact, uh, melts the rock and uh, uh, at where one uh, uh, rigid uh, part of the lithosphere, lithos in Greek means uh, rocks, uh, sphere, uh, uh, basically when you get the subduction zone, uh, particularly on the west coast of the United, uh, the United States. So in that case, uh, that geothermal energy uh, is radioactive energy, if you want to call it, uh, can be the source of producing power. So if you have a region where the magma or the molten parts of the Earth's crust uh, is close to the surface of the Earth, uh, you, you generate what's called a geothermal reservoir. Uh, and uh, if you have a, a source of water that you can bring into that geothermal reservoir, the water would evaporate, form steam, you can have another well other than the injection well that pumps the steam out and put it in a turbine and produce electricity. So in that case, uh, uh, geothermal energy is radioactive energy that we get from the Earth's atmosphere. And uh, one uh, place to visit is definitely 
uh, in the United States, the Yellowstone Park, which is the caldera or the big uh, uh, cauldron of a volcano. You'd be in the middle of a volcano when you visit the Yellowstone Park. And this is uh, the uh, ejection of uh, rainwater uh, when it heats, uh, it's heated by the rock is in the form of steam. And uh, we call this a geyser. So this is a, a, a geyser that takes the shape of a castle at Yellowstone National Park. And it tells us really about the fact that uh, radioactivity as well as uh, the friction of the tectonic plates generates uh, heat. Uh, at the Yellowstone Park, since it's uh, the caldera of a volcano, you also find what's called the fumaroles. You'll find that basically spots where steam is being ejected at high uh, pressure, superheated steam. So stay away from it when you visit there because it can scald your skin. Uh, and uh, uh, in some part of the world, uh, this tectonic activity is used to uh, a great uh, benefit. In New Zealand, they have a geothermal station that gets that water out and uses it for producing steam. Uh, and as I mentioned, uh, Iceland, uh, this is a whole geothermal plant uh, using geothermal energy, which is radioactive energy. And uh, this is uh, in uh, Italy, uh, Larderdello uh, in Tuscany, Italy. All those fumes there are uh, water coming uh, to produce uh, from the earth's crust uh, producing electricity. And I mentioned Iceland uh, using, producing all its power, uh, electrical power really from geothermal energy. So it's very active uh, at that point. Uh, can we build artificial geothermal fields? Yes, we can. That, that's used in California, New Zealand and so on. But some people suggested the use of a nuclear explosion. So in that case, you would explode a nuclear device underground. You create a cavity, the cavity collapses. And in that case, it creates a large surface area in which you uh, inject uh, cold water uh, uh, by contact with a hot, dry rock. Steam is produced, and you can create an artificial, uh, not natural, geothermal kind of power production process. Uh, this uh, leads us to talk very quickly about uh, uh, Yellowstone as a super volcano that can erupt at any time. And uh, NASA has uh, discovered that there is new activity. So scientists are thinking about reducing the pressure from the Yellowstone uh, caldera by basically uh, trying to uh, extract some of the heat to cool it down uh, in general. Another interesting aspect of radioactivity in the Earth's crust is some people uh, suggested that uh, uh, this could be the source of petroleum that is not biogenic. Now we know that petroleum and uh, coal are basically dead uh, plants for coal and dead animals in the uh, uh, world oceans. Uh, however, some geochemists think, especially from the Ukraine and Russia, uh, that the Earth's mantle, uh, which begins in depths of between seven and 70 kilometers below the surface, uh, contains uh, basically radioactivity that can interact with elements that can oxidize CO2. And in that case, it becomes a source of non-biogenic uh, or non-animal or plant-based uh, petroleum, hydrocarbons, could be natural gas. And uh, so in fact, they, fact, they did a simulation at the, uh, uh, one of the laboratories and they suggested that indeed hydrocarbons can form under high pressure if you have iron oxide as uh, a, uh, uh, as a catalyst in that case. So the steam fields of California and Nevada, both naturally occurring and make me steam, uh, is mined from the hot rocks and the typical field would have a surface area of 1,000 to 1,500 acres. And uh, we identify geothermal heat as a possible source of energy in the United States. So this is, shows the geothermal heat uh, potential in the United States. It predominates, obviously, in the mountainous regions uh, on the Western uh, states. And uh, so that is the source of energy. And all over the world, uh, uh, geothermal energy would be uh, available along the uh, areas of the tectonic plates. Uh, here in the Middle East, you could see it in the Mediterranean region, the Red Sea, 
uh, region uh, along all the west coast of the Americas, North and South America, and around the Ring of Fire in the Pacific. So that is a form of energy that is available to humanity uh, in general. All right, I'll stop sharing and uh, open up again the uh, chat room for any questions and we'll try to uh, uh, talk about gamma rays. Then uh, we'd like to talk about how to detect gamma radiation, how to uh, build instruments that uh, allow us to uh, 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 detect gamma radiation. Uh, a minute for any questions. If not, we go to cover the third chapter today. Okay, please read the material. Let's go to our next chapter. Next chapter that I would like to cover today has to do with the detection of radiation. And we emphasize the detection of uh, the detection of gamma rays with matter. So let us uh, try to find the chapter on the detection of gamma rays. And uh, somebody can help me identify where it is. I think it should be under uh, radiological science and uh, uh, gamma and X-rays detection. Uh, so our uh, wonderful electrical engineers uh, uh, helped the physics uh, uh, aspects of the learning about radiation and helped us uh, the developed instrumentation to uh, detect radiation. And without detection of radiation, we cannot uh, protect ourselves against it in general. Notice that we have different types of radiation. We have the gamma radiation, which is electromagnetic radiation. It's very penetrating and it is associated with other uh, uh, processes in radioactivity. Uh, we are still talking about radioactivity here. Uh, and uh, like uh, the alpha emission of radiation, like say plutonium-238, uh, plutonium-239 emit uh, alpha particles, but they also emit uh, an abundant amount of gamma rays. Uranium produces uh, 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 gamma rays too, so that's a way of detecting, say, the presence of uranium so that we can mine it, mine it for power uh, production. Uh, you'll find that different instruments detect different types of uh, radiation. It has to uh, do with a, a detector resolution. One type of a detector is called the sodium iodide NAI crystal detector resolution. You'll find that it has a resolution of a large range of the energy of the uh, photons that it tries to detect. But the resolution uh, decreases uh, the higher the energy of the uh, photon. So you have to take into account some kind of uh, uh, this is the uh, uh, counts per minute uh, of the uh, according to the energy of uh, a semiconductor detector. Uh, this is using germanium as a, uh, an element in that case. Uh, detectors have an efficiency that can be calculated uh, by looking at the geometry either analytically or by computer programs. And uh, uh, when you measure radiation, you have to calibrate the instrument. Uh, so, and you get a reading, say, of 20 these integrations per second. It depends on how much, say, of a solid sphere uh, surrounding the radiation source you are detecting the radiation. So you have to uh, calibrate the reading uh, in general. It depends on the efficiency also of the detector and different uh, uh, elements, as you could see here. Uh, that's a photo energy peak or photo peak germanium semiconductor detector efficiency. So they, uh, if the efficiency is low, you have to adjust for that efficiency for say for cobalt 60 to get a true number for the uh, detector, uh, the radiation that you are uh, the, uh, calculating. Uh, the most important type of uh, radiation detectors is what we call the uh, gas field detectors. And the example of the gas field detectors is what's called the Geiger Miller counter the Geiger Miller tube. So I'm going to describe how that works as a, an example. Uh, a Geiger Miller tube is a vacuum tube uh, 
uh, that contains maybe a working gas like neon. And uh, you apply uh, to the anode of the tube. Uh, it, it's a vacuum tube, so it means that it has an anode and a cathode. And uh, uh, according to the voltage of the anode uh, that you put on the anode, when a gamma photon comes in, remember today we said that the gamma photons can interact by the ionization of the filling gas in the detector. I'll show you a picture of detectors in a moment. And uh, if you create ionization, electrons are emitted. So every time a gamma photon through the Compton scattering or pho the photoelectric effect or the pair production process uh, generate a, an electron, uh, that electron can discharge from uh, the anode uh, to, uh, uh, inside the detector uh, just a little maybe rod inside the, the tube of uh, uh, glass filled with maybe a neon, uh, almost like a neon bulb. Uh, in that case, you find for each radiation uh, emitting an electron, you get a count. And uh, basically, this is the uh, ions collected. So you put those ions that you collect into a scalar that counts how many ions you are getting per minute. And in that case, you can calculate the activity of the radiation source. Now, in terms of uh, the detection uh, efficiency of uh, uh, a tube, in that case for gamma rays, uh, it depends on the voltage that you put on the anode. So at uh, a low voltage, uh, it acts as an instrument that we call an ionization chamber. You notice here it measures the ionization. When you increase the voltage at the anode to 500 volt, you'll find that there is a proportionality between the number of ions you collect or uh, uh, the uh, radiation counts that your detector tells you and the voltage. So that you find that there is a straight line here, a proportionality uh, uh, method uh, that is basically uh, uh, a way of getting, uh, relating the voltage that you are using uh, to the number of counts that the detector counts every time an electron is emitted by, say, a source of gamma rays, so Compton scattering, air production, uh, the photoelectric effect that we studied today. If you put in a voltage at around 1,000 volts, uh, you find that you get a plateau here, it's flat area uh, for the counts, very convenient in that case. Uh, you don't need to take into account the proportionality, and this is designated as a Geiger-Miller tool. And you stop there because if you increase the voltage beyond that uh, one kilovolt or 1,000 volts, uh, you would get a continuous discharge in the tube. And the tube would look very much like a neon uh, tube, but with a rod uh, in the center, uh, which would be the cathode uh, uh, that uh, where a discharge happened every time an electron is generated by gamma radiation or X-rays interacting with the filling gas, the neon in that case. And uh, this is a picture actually of some of those detectors. Uh, this would be ionization chamber and that would be a Geiger-Miller tube. You'll find here a, uh, an ammeter uh, that measures the strengths of the discharge. And as you measure the strengths of the discharge, you can convert that into uh, 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 emissions of counts per minute or counts per hour. The ionization chamber is nothing than a gold leaf uh, electroscope uh, you basically charge the particles. This would be the charging component. And as you charge the uh, particle, you have a leaf of gold that uh, uh, <clears throat> uh, uh, repulses another uh, rod. And as radiation goes through it, the charge on the leaf of gold is reduced. So in that case, by the reduction on a screen that you can see by looking with one eye from one side here, you can tell how much uh, is the dose of radiation received by the person carrying that uh, ionization chamber. Uh, these are all the devices that were used in uh, during the Cold War. Uh, right now, these devices have been turned, that I'll show you in a moment, into solid state devices, much smaller in size. You don't have to carry that uh, whole thing. Uh, you have four batteries, C cell batteries inside. Uh, however, it's provided uh, to teachers uh, for to uh, use it for experiments in the classroom and show, uh, teach students about radiation. Uh, proportional counters are used uh, in many places. You find that they take the shape of almost like a plate. And uh, uh, when uh, uh, any uh, 
trucks or trains coming into a nuclear facility like nuclear power plants, they go in between two plates. Uh, they're inconspicuous. Uh, uh, the truck drivers don't know what's going on there, but those uh, proportional counters measure if there is any radiation coming in or leaving out the plant. So this is, uh, in essence, the, how those Geiger-Müller tubes look like. It's ev an evacuated tube. It takes so many different shapes, even a disc or a tube. And inside it, there is a rod. Uh, uh, you get, create a vacuum there. And uh, inside the tube, you would have a, an anode for a discharge. So this is a symbol of the tube here. It is grounded. And uh, you have that rod in the center of an evacuated tube. If gamma radiation comes and interacts with the filling gas, neon, and you place a voltage here, uh, five, it shows here 500 volt DC or 1,000 volt DC, then uh, the electron, uh, uh, in the gamma rays interact with the filling gas, let's say neon, an electron is emitted and you get a discharge between the ground and the uh, anode of the tube. Each time there is one single discharge, it goes to an electric circuit, having a condenser here uh, and two resistors, and it goes to uh, an emitter. And every pulse uh, is counted and the uh, scalar in that case in electronics, uh, as it's called in electronics, gives you the how many uh, counts you get per second, and that would be a unit of the Becquerel. So in fact, uh, uh, this is very sensitive electronic instrumentation that can measure, for instance, the number of atoms of a radioactive substance inside a human body. So it's very, very uh, sensitive uh, in that case. Uh, uh, sometimes you need to uh, measure very low levels of radiation. So in that case, you want to amplify the signal that you are getting for, of course, eventually, it's a Compton scattering or a photoelectric or the fair production uh, process. So in that case, you use what's called the photomultiplier tubes, uh, and uh, that can be uh, put into instrumentation that measures not just uh, uh, the radiation from one type of radioisotope, say, in, in the human body or an environment of a lab, but it can measure it at different energy levels so you can identify what are the isotopes. In that case, it's called the multi-channel pulse height analyzer. However, uh, the photomultiplier tubes take a source of electrons uh, and simply multiply uh, the source of gamma radiation or X-rays. And as it multiplies them, so that's an amplifier, basically, a photomultiplier tube, you can measure very, very, very low levels of radiation. So you get the incoming light, it measures light to photomultiplier tubes uh, or X-rays or gamma rays. It goes to a photo uh, cathode with a gas envelope and an electron coming through uh, decreasing potentials. Here you have that resistor that distributes an applied voltage. As I said, for geiger miller tube is about one kilovolt or 1,000 volts. You divide the voltage level through those resistors and uh, add them to basically what's called the dynodes. Every time an electron falls on a dynode, it is multiplied and multiplied and multiplied and multiplied. And on the other side, a very, very weak source of say gamma or X-rays now can be measured in the scalar or the emitter part of the tube uh, in general. So this is called the photo multiplier tube and uh, it's a way of measuring very low level radiation. Uh, another way of measuring radiation, particularly uh, for uh, neutrons, is to use a sodium iodide scintillator. So you use a high Z element uh, like uh, iodine, and uh, it's used in sodium uh, iodide, and uh, it gives us a very good efficiency for gamma ray detection. You add a little amount of sodium. Remember, sodium 208 was one of the isotopes that occur in nature in the decay uh, graph of. Uh, uranium uh, or thorium. And uh, basically uh, that solium uh, is added to the sodium iodide. So the uh, detector is now called the sodium iodide solium uh, for the crystal. And uh, uh, you can also use uh, gamma rays from cesium-137 and you get three inch diameters uh, uh, scintillation detector. So scintillation detector gets the light from the photon and multiplies it uh, and uh, then takes send it to the detector. This would be the absorption efficiencies uh, for basically uh, 
this uh, uh, the radiation uh, absorption against the energies of the uh, gamma rays. So you need to calibrate your instrument before uh, using uh, using it in general. Uh, some scintillators use just plastic uh, materials, uh, very rugged. And uh, lately, uh, these uh, uh, tubes that I've shown you, the yellow ones, are replaced by semiconductor devices. So you use uh, 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 semiconductor silicon or germanium or cadmium telluride, mercuric iodide, gallium arsenide. Of course, this is used in computer ships. And uh, in that case, you find that different uh, uh, materials have different number of electrons. And uh, basically, the uh, for electron pair production. Remember one of the processes of gamma rays detection, uh, they have different uh, uh, efficiencies in uh, measuring uh, the radiation. And uh, these are meant for high gamma photons in general. Uh, for the detection of neutrons, you need a germanium based detector like in uh, the solid state physics. In that case, you need to cool it. So this is a flask containing uh, nitrogen. Uh, uh, this is called the cooling cryostat, and uh, that liquid nitrogen cools the detector and makes it uh, basically more efficient. Here, the detector itself now uh, with some uh, liquid nitrogen makes it efficient for the detection of neutrons. Notice that the detection of neutrons will be much more difficult than the detection of gamma rays. Why? Neutrons are neutral, so they are not easy uh, in terms of they do not produce ion uh, direct ionization. It's indirect ionization that they cause us. Uh, this is the form of the liquid nitrogen uh, dipstick cryostat, as it's called, uh, to keep the uh, germanium detector at cryogenic temperatures to measure neutrons in general. All right, different uh, energy resolutions for different detectors differ. Uh, the proportional counter would have uh, basically uh, 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 an efficiency, what's called at full widths have maximum. Uh, uh, the proportional counter uh, is 1.2 at 5.9 kilovolt radiation. The sodium iodide thallium detector is three. Uh, the silicon lithium detector 0.16 and the germanium is 0.18. So that's a whole area of uh, instrumentation uh, in general. Uh, in terms of uh, uh, the use of detectors, I are used uh, definitely for uh, radiological safety. Uh, in a nuclear power plant, you want to measure the radiation level in different parts of the plant uh, so that not to expose, of course, people to unhealthy uh, levels of radiation. And that would be a whole chapter that we'll cover uh, later on. Uh, lately, though, there is a fear of a uh, non national group trying to disrupt societies. So uh, in that case, uh, uh, radiological security is used in emergency management in the case of an accident but also uh, to uh, protect uh, populations against nefarious acts of terrorism. Uh, you'll find that uh, it's associated with first responders. First responders uh, do not just deal with fires, but they also deal with spills of radiation in medical environment, uh, nuclear medicine, for instance. Uh, during the transportation of the radiation, uh, accidents can happen and you have to contain the radiation. And definitely uh, here, border security. We don't want people to uh, bring in some, uh, not just a nuclear device that would explode, just uh, the fear of radiation. They can uh, spread some radiation in a given environment and uh, cause a panic. In fact, uh, it's uh, uh, unwarranted because the more you spread the radiation, uh, the less it becomes effective in harming people. Uh, for uh, the different uh, detectors, this is now, uh, uh, almost uh, the instead of having that large detector with four C batteries, you find that personnel working in any radiation environment carried a very small uh, detector here, a personal monitor of radiation. It could be as simple as a, uh, 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 an old kind of uh, camera film. And the more radiation affects it, the more it becomes blackened uh, or affected. So this is a personal electronic uh, dosimeter, that is the size it takes uh, in, in a color. But I suggested that for nuclear installations or uh, hospital uh, x-ray uh, 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 kind of uh, uh, <clears throat> installations, 
uh, people go through a whole body detector here. So this is a gamma and neutron monitor. Anybody getting into a nuclear power plant or a nuclear installation uh, has to go through it. And that detector can detect almost to the, uh, uh, the number of atoms of radioactive substance in the human body. And uh, some interesting situation happened by people walking in their shoes on the calcium chloride that's used uh, in the winter to melt the ice <laughs> and it contains some radioactivity. So they kept uh, uh, triggering those uh, detectors until it was discovered. As I suggested, uh, any in nuclear installation uh, for trucks and trains, I can show you a picture for the trains, you'll have those big long uh, tower uh, uh, detectors. These are proportional uh, counters and uh, it can detect any special nuclear material uh, getting into the facility or moving outside of the facility. And this instrumentation is very, very uh, effective and very sensitive in general. Uh, this is uh, a seal system uh, for imaging uh, uh, what goes on inside a nuclear facility. We always see, of course, those outside cameras. Now there have been miniaturized in size much smaller than this, but I'm showing the whole surveillance camera. So a nuclear facilities have the sort of, but in fact, all installations have now those surveillance cameras uh, detecting uh, motion and uh, around the facility. Uh, this is a handheld identifier, checks the contents of a 55 gallon drum that's used for waste uh, at a nuclear facility. It's a nuclear power plant, uh, 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 contaminated clothing or paper towels and so on, gloves and so on. And uh, this is now a detector that uses uh, a germanium detector. So it uses some of that uh, liquid nitrogen. And then here you can detect the presence of neutrons. Uh, as I said, neutrons interact uh, by different processes. They interact with the uh, low Z elements like hydrogen, uh, and they don't generate the electrons that uh, are generated by the Compton scattering, pair production, and a uh, photoelectric effect uh, that would make it easier to detect as gamma rays. This is uh, today that's a personal radiation detector, solid state basis. So it gives you directly, not necessarily the count rate or the activity, but the dose of radiation, how much energy is deposited uh, in the human body uh, in that case. We'll cover that in a chapter by itself on radiation dosimetry. Uh, when sources of radiation uh, are a very short range, say an alpha emitter that would happen on the surface of a, an object, then you need a surface detector. So in that case, uh, this is called a survey meter. Uh, and these are survey probes for beta, uh, radioisotopes emitting beta particles and X-ray and gamma radiation too. They can also detect it, but they are really meant for surface there. Uh, and this would be a survey meter. A person would uh, use it to level uh, uh, measure, you could see this, the scale here, shows you the level of the radiation. And it doesn't measure only uh, uh, human-made radiation sources. You'll find that it is very useful uh, just also to measure uh, environmental sources of radiation. Uh, this is another whole body contamination monitor. If you ever work in the nuclear industry, at the beginning of your employment, uh, you go through that whole body counter it counts how much radiation is in your body so that in the case of an accident, uh, the number would increase and uh, basically you would be uh, uh, protected and uh, in identifying sources of radiation. If you measure also nuclear installations, uh, very inconspicuous, you'll find the area radiation monitors that goes through uh, maybe uh, uh, either a radio kind of communications, uh, uh, or through wiring to a monitoring process. If you go after the COVID-19 to uh, public events like a football uh, game, uh, inconspicuous, you'll find one of those vans here. This is a radiation patrol mobile monitoring van and it creates basically a map of any sources of radiation within say the environment of the uh, stadium uh, in general. So in that case, uh, associated uh, with the, uh, the use of nuclear uh, energy in install, uh, nuclear uh, in uh, uh, many of our uh, uh, events, social events, uh, uh, monitoring radiation has become a very important part of the uh, 
uh, modern society. Uh, we have reached 